Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, many years ago, I went to see a sparker, a marine sparker in a, in a harbor, and I was absolutely charmed to notice that you could tell the difference between gas pockets on the one hand with one polarity and hard rocks with another polarity, and it made a lot of difference. And I've wondered throughout my life what it was that made polarity so obvious on that data and so d difficult to see on most of our data. Well, uh, I think I've, found, uh, I've fallen onto it finally, and so that's why I came here all the way to London to tell you the story. Seismogram polarity can become much more apparent when deconvolution removes the correct source wavelet. We learned this from inverse theory. I learned this from inverse theory. But with inverse theory, there's many complications in learning how to do it all and get it right. But the essential feature is a memorable trick that I can squeeze into this 20-minute talk. Start by the definition of a Ricker wavelet. You probably all know about it. Causal deconvolution, the industrial standard, will try to create a spike here at the onset. What I'll be doing is creating a spike here in the middle. Probably a lot of people have tried this, but there's a lot of ways to make it not work right. At least I certainly discovered a bunch of them. Okay, so here we have a constant offset section, and what you see here is a Ricker wave. That's black at the onset, white just after the onset, and then black after that. And here you have the top of the salt, black, white, black. And here you have the bottom of the salt, you can almost see white, black, white. Here you have a bubble that's going to go away as a byproduct of deconvolution. So let's uh, see what happens. So here's the data, uh, here's the uh, deconvolution, and now we see that the water bottom is white and the top of the salt is white. And we see that the bottom of the salt is black, <clears throat> and we see black events over here, and a white event up here that goes a long ways, another black event there, black, black crossing events there, and a black event up here. And I like the black events because that's where the earth is getting softer, and usually the earth gets harder, so it's kind of like a treasure hunt to find a a black event. Okay, so now let me give you a second between each blink, and you can follow these events on your own. All over the place. Okay, I wish we could say we always got results this good, but sometimes there's just too many events and you can't see what's going on. Okay, so uh, <clears throat> here's the, uh, here's a, I started with a spectrum of a thousand traces in the Gulf of Mexico, and I averaged a spectrum of every one of them with all together, and I computed a deconvolution filter, and the inverse of that deconvolution filter should be the shot waveform, but it is not a Ricker wavelet. And so we've been making this assumption for 55 years, and you've just seen seismic data that shows you should be, should be looking at Ricker wavelets, and you're not looking at them with conventional causal predictive decon. So what I'm going to show you is how to use the same amplitude spectrum, same amplitude spectrum, I want to come up with a different phase spectrum and we'll have a Ricker wavelet at the onset and that's how we get these nice results. Okay, so here we start from the industrial standard. It's all zeros before t equals zero. We'll start adding little bits of information here before t equals zero. Here's just 4 milliseconds before t equals 0, 8 milliseconds, 16 milliseconds before t equals 0, 32 milliseconds before t equals 0. This is my favorite result here, is that 64 milliseconds before t equals 0. Now I'm going to overdo it. I'm going to go to 128 milliseconds, so there'll be more stuff out here. And I'm going to overdo it some more, take this, double it again, 256 mils, and now we're going to get a, a bad result. The result is starting to deteriorate. This bubble, which should be occurring after t equals zero, is starting to occur before t equals zero. So I came up with this magic number of 60 milliseconds. How did I do that? I, I measured the time difference between the bubble and the end of the Ricker wavelet, and that was 120 mils, and divide by two, so 60 mils is what I said is the parameter that we need to choose to make this work. I'm going to tell you how I did it, what calculation I did. It's just an analytic solution. It's not an optimization problem. Uh, industry has a bunch of terms and a lot of history, and here it is. Uh, they typically do things in the time domain with the cost of computation, which goes as n squared, where that's the size of the filter. I will be doing things in the frequency domain, 
It's theoretically equivalent. The n log n computation is faster, but I don't care about that. The Komogorov method is not well known. It should be. It's been published all over the place in my textbook and in the literature. The code is even out there. But it's 20th century mathematics, so it is not 19th and even 18th century mathematics that we use a lot. This is 20th century stuff. So it took us a little longer to get onto it. <clears throat> Uh, what we're going to do in this talk is we're going to adopt the Kolmogorov method. We're going to make it Ricker compliant. The Ricker Kolmogorov method is totally causal. We're going to make it have a Ricker wavelet at its beginning. Uh, so here's the way the talk is going to go. <clears throat> I should mention, by the way, there was during during the Great War, there was some math uh, competition between a Russian mathematician here, Kolmogorov, and an American mathematician, Norbert Wiener. And uh, you can see who I think won that uh, won that competition. Luckily, Ricker, the American, comes along, and he's going to give you today's modification. Okay, so first we're going to look at the statement of the theorem. I'm not going to prove the theorem in my talk because the proof is in the abstract, and it's really not that hard. And then we're going to look at the Kolmogorov method, and finally you know, I'll have a single line that tells you what to how to modify the Kolmogorov method. Okay, so this. Statement of the Kolmogorov theorem. Well, you start with a causal time function. It vanishes before t equals zero. You Fourier transform it. After you Fourier transformed it, you exponentiate it. After you exponentiate it, you have a new frequency function. Then you bring that into the time domain, and it's causal. That's the statement, uh, that's the theorem. In other words, we can summarize this theorem by saying the exponential of a causal is another causal. Uh, we're going to be parameterizing things with this C function up in the exponent here. So that's a little different because industry standard is to parameterize things here by this uh, inverse, by the decon filter, that is this inverse of this. Uh, and if C is causal, the Kolmogorov theorem says that the shot waveform is causal and the decon filter is causal. In other words, that's a definition of minimum phase, the fact that the filter and its inverse are both causal. So Francis Muir likes to say, the exponential of a causal is minimum phase. A very nice summary. So let's look now at the Kolmogorov construction. So we start with a spectrum, which we know. We're looking for a phase, which we do not know. And we're going to use Fourier methodology. We have sums of, four, of these exponents, and they'll be really secretly Fourier sums. But if you do this mathematical substitution, what looks like a Fourier sum starts to look like a polynomial. This is a, called a Z-transform. So we start with a spectrum. We're looking for the phase spectrum. Uh, the first step is to replace r by e to the log r. That's basic mathematics. And then uh, Fourier transform would bring us over to this picture over here. And uh, <clears throat> This is, a, a time, this is still a frequency function, but it's a time domain parameterization. These u's are in the time domain, and they parameterize this frequency function. And what we're really looking for is to use the Kolmogorov theorem, which says we want this time domain function here to be causal, vanish before t equals 0. So let's continue with the construction. We start with the spectrum. We're an, uh, it's an even function of omega. That means the log spectrum is an even function of omega. This means we have the even part in the log spectral domain, in the time domain. And uh, we're, we're, to get the whole function, we need the odd part. And the odd part tells us the phase. The phase is what we really want to know. And the method to find this odd part in this phase is given right here. If you add the even part and the odd part together, you want to have a causal function. So these you just match these functions up on the negative tau axis, and then they, you've got the right answer for the positive tau axis. So the, in, in, the innovation here, what's my talk, everything I've been telling you is textbook stuff. My talk is simply this. This is the way to make a, a, a deconvolution Ricker compliant is you take this odd part, which we've just calculated through Kolmogorov's method, and you weaken it a little bit at small lags. I have to tell you what I mean by small and uh, Ricker compliant. So this will be what you'll see next. Okay, we've already seen all of these things, all of these plots here. Uh, we took a, we scanned through all these functions, and so you started with causality, in, added increasing amounts of non-causality, and finally we got to the best, what I call the best answer at 60 mils. And so how did I get this best answer? I had the phase spectrum. 
I took the phase spectrum into the time domain. This is a time domain, a lag domain. I multiplied the phase function by one out here, and one, 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 get to 60 mils, and I multiply by sine squared. So the function goes down to zero at zero lag. And then it comes back up again, and then we continue on multiplying by one. Okay, that's all I did. So why didn't we figure this out 40 years ago? Well, <laughs> everybody got interested in migration, that's why. Uh, I did too. <laughs> now, so the, basically, to summarize any uh, the story here, you can take anybody's deconvolution filter, and you can make it reveal polarity a lot better if you make it respect uh, Ricker, Ricker, Ricker compliance. So what you have to do is take the phase spectrum, bring it into the time domain, and near zero lag, dampen it down. That's it. 16 words. You can walk out of my talk now, and if you remember those 16 words, you remember the whole talk. So there are two uses for this Ricker trick. Here's my co-author, Antoine Guiton, and I have this conversation with Antoine. I say, Antoine, you're doing the optimization problem. Your sparseness code gets better polarities than my simple analytic method. Antoine says to me, John, your Ricker code is much easier to choose the parameters. I have to choose weighting functions, regularizations, all that other stuff. <clears throat> okay, that's true. Now, here's, here's, a, here's a new way to look at all this stuff, and uh, I really like this way of looking at it. We start from, it's more insightful, more insightful way to look at it. We start from what we learned from Komagora method. We have these u sub taws, and this is a summation, and we write this summation as, and group it into three parts, A, B, and C, and uh, that, that means we have a product of three filters, and the definition of A, B, and C is that a has got the inner lags, B has got the medium lags, and C has got the long lags. Okay, so and we had to choose this gap here was uh, was uh, 60 milliseconds. And there's another gap here which is about it's 6 or 8 milliseconds, something like that. And we don't actually chop the series up like this. We actually use, we use a weighting function to taper it in and out. I just showed you, we use a sine squared weighting function to uh, make this division here. I use another sine squared weighting function to choose that division down there. So the inner lags, uh, inner lags like, this is like two milliseconds or three, four milliseconds or something. The inner lags are what make the very high frequencies. Uh, lots of people do deconvolution. Nobody wants to look at 200 hertz output. So when they finish the deconvolution, they do a bandpass filter. So we don't do that. We just build it right in. We just leave out the part A. We set A equal to zero. The middle part here is the Ricker wavelet. We told you how to modify those terms if you want to Ricker wavelet. And the, and the long lags are the bubble. You're going to see some examples of that. So I've got four data sets to show you. First, I'm going to zoom through them quickly and just have you look at the third lag. I'm going to make the claim that every time I look, the third lag is too small. So this is the industrial standard, strictly causal. Gulf of Mexico, Gulf of California, Cascadia, that's offshore Oregon, uh, Chevron, Australia, brand new data from Chevron. Good stuff. Okay, so... Uh, Two of these data sets are, are four mils, this one, this one, and two of the data sets are two mils. Two mils, four mils. Doesn't matter what you do. Okay, so that's what happens with the strictly causal. Now, uh, the, uh, the Ricker compliance always works. We'll just see those. If you look down here, you see it's always going to work. I mean, it's always Ricker compliant because it's forced to be. Uh, and what's kind of interesting, really, is this picture on the bottom. It's to see the bubble without seeing the ghosts. Can't really do this physically, or can you? Because you always have the ghosts. Because the surface of the ocean is always there. Okay, so if you want to see the bubble without the ghosts, this is what it would look like, if you'd like to see it. And it uh, really looks nice here in the Gulf of California. And... Uh, at Cascadia, offshore Oregon, it looks like the bubble is a lot smaller. And in uh, Chevron, Australia, it looks like the bubble is a lot smaller. But it really isn't smaller. I'll tell you why it really isn't smaller. The problem is that the spike is a lot bigger because it has 200 hertz information in the spike. And here we only have 125 hertz information in this spike. So the 4 mil data seems to have bigger bubbles. And in reality, uh, bubbles are large because the, the scaling is not accurate 
when you have this broad bandwidth. Okay, we'll, well, we'll get to see the examples on the real data. Uh, just a reminder now here, we started with the Kolmogorov function, we broke this sum into three parts, the small lags, the medium lags, and the large lags. I'm going to tell you how I create these outputs now. We want to ignore the Nyquist region around the neighborhood of the Nyquist. We set A equal to zero. That's, that's the lags here that go up to about six, eight milliseconds. Four milliseconds, I don't know. You try this parameter and choose what you like. It's like the high frequency cutoff. Okay, so this is a strictly causal. This is, this is what you might call this the industry standard right on top. Now, if we monkey it around at the B, uh, we get the Ricker compliant wave deconvolution. That's this one. Divide this one out of the data. And if you'd like to see the bubble with no ghosts, you simply divide by C. Forget about both A and B. Nice bubbles. So why did I put the word pseudo-unitary in my title of my talk? Well, maybe I shouldn't have. I don't really know. But if you set A equal to zero or B equal to zero or C equal to zero, these are statements that you make a priori. And whenever you make one of them, you're saying that the exponential is one. So in other words, the filter doesn't do anything for those lags. You've designed a, you've designed a filter that does nothing for certain lags. And so if it does nothing, then you can say, if it did nothing for all lags, it'd become unitary, but nobody would like that. So I'm not sure I should stick with that title or no idea. But anyway, that's, that is the idea. Okay, so here's some Gulf of Mexico data, and here it is after debubbling. That is just dividing by the A to the C. And I want to show you this, where the cursor is now, is a lots of bubbles in the salt layer, in the, in the salt layer. There's also bubbles up here in the shallower section. Very easy to see. Look at this black thing along here. And there's bubbles on both sides. Oh, sorry. Oh, got, yeah, accidentally jumped into Gulf of California. Okay, here's the Gulf of California. It has a nice big bubble here. You see the same bubble over here. And maybe you can see another bubble down here. It'll all be much more clear when I start blinking. You'll see other bubbles over here and bubbles down here. So let's go. Are you spotting them down in here? Spot them over here. Okay, now let's look down to the next data set. Here's Cascadia. Well, there's lots of bubbles down here. Over here, I can somehow imagine I'm seeing higher order bubbles, more lags. And here is the, uh, oh, backwards. Excuse me. Here's the Chevron Australia data. Uh, the easiest place to spot the bubble would be right about in here. Once you spotted that, you may even see the second bubble as well as the first bubble. Well, maybe it's easier to see the second bubble over here. And you can see, if you don't get used to this, you can see it down in here as well. Okay, um, let me try to help you out. This is no bubble, no bubble, bubble, no bubble, bubble, no bubble, bubble, no bubble, bubble, no bubble. bubble. Okay, so uh, same parameter for all four data sets. That parameter is 60 milliseconds. It's easy, it's fun, it really works, so why don't you try it? Uh, for our ongoing and future work, we are working on developing more angle dependence in uh, these functions, and we continue to do inverse modeling. Sorry, there wasn't time for that here at the EAGE meeting. The inverse modeling, we're using optimization theory, we're using robust norms, and an interesting thing we're doing is convolution does not commute with gain. So seismic data needs to be gained, and the convolution operator does not commute with that. Uh, we think we know how to handle that in principle, and we can improve our results by doing things right. We need more data. We'd love to show you more results, but we need more data for that. Uh, the biggest problem we have here is intellectual property lawyers that expect us to sign all kinds of papers about protecting the data. 
Honestly, folks, I'm retired. I'm here for the fun. If I can't get data that's free, uh, that I can't share with other universities, I'm just not going to do it. So there. <laughs> I'd like to acknowledge uh, my uh, co-worker, co-author, co Antoine Guitton here, and uh, I need to acknowledge the people that gave us data, Chevron Australia and other people. Uh, Western Geophysical, I think, in here. Uh, I'd like to thank Stu Levin for assistance with input, and we'd especially like to thank the sponsors of the Stanford Exploration Project, who continue to support this work and who are paying my trip to London. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. I can take questions now. If you'd like to uh, see the talk again, you can find it on YouTube, or at least you can find my last practice talk. Now, all I need to do is find the place to stop recording. Okay, bye.